Um, I'm going to turn it on, OK? OK. Stop sharing. Um, good evening. I'd just like to say welcome and thank you for dropping into our fostering event this evening. My name is Maria. I work in the fostering service. My job is mainly about recruiting foster carers. And this is Sarah, who is my colleague, and her job is the inquiry officer. Do you want to say a little bit? Yeah, OK, so I am your first port of call. Um, I will be the person that you speak to if you ring up or even if you send in an email, you will be getting some sort of contact with me. Um, I will share with you as much information as I can and I will try and get you through the whole process as quickly and as friendly as I can. OK, so thank you. Tonight we're going to talk a little bit about um, the different types of fostering, about the process that's involved to become a foster carer. But it's mostly about this is your opportunity to ask us any questions you have, any questions at all, whatever you they might be, just to give you a little bit more advice and an, uh, an idea about what fostering for Oxfordshire County Council is like. Um, we have got a slideshow, so we could share some information with you that way. Um, technical difficulties, Te bear with us. Technical <laughs> difficulties because I'm not actually sure how I'm doing it. Oh, here we go. Sorry. <laughs> um, right. So one of the um, one of the slides here just shows a little bit about um, the kind of benefits of fostering with Oxfordshire County Council. Um, Obviously, there are a huge amount of benefits. I would say mostly one of the uh, things that we um, get told by people that foster for us is it's about fostering within your local community. So when you foster within Oxfordshire, you're looking after children who will be local and you're keeping, you're enabling those children to stay close to their schools, friends and their family, which is hugely important. Uh, one of the things that we do is we give you a setup fee of £1,500 to help make the transition into foster care. That's because we know that there's a lot involved in maybe some of the things could be getting um, the room ready for the child um, that's going to stay there. Buying some toys, yeah, appropriate for ch uh, children coming in. So those kind of things that you just need to to do to prepare and also you might be thinking that you're going to reduce your hours maybe to foster if you do work full time. Not that that is totally necessary, but some people choose to do that. If you um, and when you foster, you do get a fee paid, which is an amount of money that is for you as a foster carer. In addition to that, you get an allowance which basically covers the cost of the child living with you. So that's to cover things like their clothes, um, making sure that they've got, say, um, school uniform, activities, or groups, activities, yeah. things like that. Just general costs of having uh, the child live with you. Uh, you get a dedicated social worker. So that's a social worker that comes under the fostering team. Um, and she is allocated to look after you, to support you, to make sure that, you know, we're always thinking of your needs. And then there's also a social worker that is there to really be more the focus on the child and the child's needs. So those two social workers uh, work alongside each other, alongside you to make sure that the care that is needed is being given to the child and that you're totally supported to do that. Uh, there's a lot of access to professionals that work within the county council. So things like the attached team, who are a team of psychologists that are there to help both the carer and the child. Um, and then there are links with support groups and lots of specialist training. Obviously, there's training that happens um, in the in first initial part of your assessment, which is called Skills to Foster. 
uh, which is a two day course. Two full days. We offer two days in the week or we alternate it and then one month it will be two Saturdays to accommodate people that perhaps work full time or have to arrange childcare. That's right. Um, and really that's to, as it says, skills to foster is to give you all the skills that you need to initially start off your fostering journey. Um, basically, it will talk a little bit about uh, the types of children, about um, how the child feels when they first um, move in with a carer, the legalities around fostering. It covers a huge amount really in two days, but then there's loads, loads more training that you can access once you get going. Um, and that's something that you're very much encouraged to do. There are certain courses that you have to do on a regular basis. So your first aid training is something you do annually. Uh, safeguarding training, that's something done annually as well. And if you do look after a child with a disability, then you have to do um, um, the specialised, depending the special. on what their difficulties yeah. are. Absolutely. Um, so that's really a bit about Oxfordshire, what we kind of offer. But like I said, I think the most important thing to think about is when you're fostering in Oxfordshire, you're fostering alongside um, many other foster carers. So we have around 250 foster carers in the county. So there will be the likelihood is there is somebody already fostering in your town, maybe in your village. So you're going to have access to other people and you can meet up with those foster carers at the support groups. Uh, there are informal ways that our, our foster carers connect with each other. There's WhatsApp groups, There's, but it's basically about the fact that you are working alongside your local authority who are local, the children are local and there are other carers. So we're building this little local community of foster carers and that's something that people really seem to enjoy the fact that they're doing something locally for their community but well, we've got a great support network with the OFCA as well yep so the Oxfordshire Foster Care Association they are a local association that are formed by Oxfordshire foster carers uh, they are a charity so they have um, a grant given to them by the County Council, but they also raise loads of money themselves. They're always raising lots of money and they offer events and activities for children. So recent events that they've done, they've done some cooking classes. Um, they take the kids. Um, they've got pantomime. Pantomime. Time of year, so yeah. Good. Um, every year they go to the pantomime and um, their activities are very much not just for the children, they're for the family and they're for the birth children as well. So if there's a foster family and they have their own birth children, it's very important that we recognise the contribution that that child is making. I mean, they're basically sharing, sharing their parents, sharing their parents and, and their home and their yeah, toys. Yeah. yeah. And it's 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 a big it's a big thing and it's a, um, a commitment that we need to know right from the beginning that the children are on board and we we you know like to do things that recognise um, what they're doing. But interestingly, we do have foster carers who have grown up in a fostering family and go on to foster themselves, mm -hmm. which surely is saying that it's a good thing yeah. that they've enjoyed it. I think most of our foster carers are going to tell you that it's really enhanced their own child's kind of views and um, thoughts around um, caring for other children. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about fostering with us. I suppose we should clear up really that you don't have to be a couple foster. Nope. Single, single people can do it. Absolutely. There is no um, age restriction other than the fact that you have to be over 18, although most of our um, carers would be over 21, but we are an authority that say you have to be over 18. Uh, there is no upper age limit. We just ask that you have um, you're in good health and therefore you are able to care for a child. Uh, you don't have to be married. You can be in a partnership with somebody of um, same sex. Same sex. Yeah. Uh, if you have your own children, that's great. If you don't have children, we've also got fair, uh, foster carers that don't and haven't had that experience themselves. 
but have maybe um, cared for children, maybe as Baby a sack, yeah. auntie or something. But things like that aren't, you know, it's not necessary. We're not saying that um, we, we're looking for a certain type of person. It's really we're looking for people that um, are willing to adapt their life to caring for another child. And they can offer that love and support that that child has been missing out on for whatever reason yeah and it's about your experiences really and what kind of um how that ex your experiences in, in your own life what kind of person that's made you be and and that's what we kind of draw out in the assessment i think if we go on to another slide that's about the steps to becoming a foster carer, which we'll talk about a little bit more um, the initial steps in a minute. But basically through the assessment, I think that's when it gives us an opportunity to find out about um, what kind of person you are. Up, up their own upbringing. Yeah. So basically you might, we might ask you, um, you know, how were you parented? Um, and how do you feel about that and how you would parent or how you have parented your own child and things like that. So that's about the assessment is very much a time for us to uh, look at your your history, your experience, maybe your work um, and things like that. Should we go through the actual process? Yeah, I'd be good to think. OK, so first of all, what we would wait for is for somebody to contact us. Um, like I said, this tonight is an opportunity for you to ask lots and lots of questions. Um, but at some point in time, you might want to email us, ring us, fill, it up, fill in an online submission form or something like that. And that's your way of first contacting us. So then Sarah gets the opportunity to get in touch with you and follow that up and ask you a few questions. Uh, so basically, you ask them. Um, yeah, so I will ask you some basic information about your home life. Um, if you've got obviously any other children living at home, any other adults perhaps. Um, what you do, whether with you work full time, part time. Um, what kind of experience you have, but also what your kind of understanding is of fostering. Because like, you would have um, obviously found the information online to get in contact with us or one of the first things that I will do when I get some sort of contact from anybody inquiring is I will send an email out with a lot of information about the service, about the finances, about the training. So it's, it's you know, it's just a quick, quick 10, 15 minute phone call after that just to get some basic information and to see how you feel about progressing. And then the next step then would be for me to book a home visit for one of our social workers to come out and have that bit more of an in-depth conversation and give you even, even more opportunities for you to ask any questions. Yeah, so the initial home visit basically can take anything from an hour to an hour and a half. A uh, social worker comes around and if you are intending on um, putting an application in with a partner, then they would like to meet both you yeah. and your partner. Uh, they do have a look at around the house, which is basically just for us to see that your home um, is uh, kind of able to to have a child come and stay with you. We would normally ask for a spare room. Um, there are some situations where a child under the age of two can stay in a cot in the carer's room. Um, so, the, but that does then mean that there are some limitations about what type of fostering you can offer if you don't have a spare room. But certainly, if that is your situation, then we would still welcome to have a chat with you about that. So, yeah, so they look around the house, they have a chat with you, a lot more about your motivation, why you want to foster, a little bit more about your background, they'll ask. Um, and really, it's and this is your opportunity to ask them a lot more about fostering because at some stage we're going to kind of want to start to think about what type of fostering might fit with you. Um, so after the home visit, if you decide to go ahead, then you'll put an application form in and you'll send that off. Sarah or Hannah, who is one of our support workers, they will receive the application. And then from there we go on to do what's called the stage one of an assessment. 
which is really when we do things like um, ask for you to have a medical references references. So we ask for uh, up to six referees, six if you're a couple, three if you're an individual, and then we follow up at least two of those. And what we mean by that is we actually follow follow up with the person that um, has sent the reference in and we go and speak to them and we just find out a little bit more. So basically in those references, we're looking for people that have known you um, probably as a couple or they might have known one of you even oh, could be from school yeah. or something like that. So it's just somebody that knows you on a personal basis. So um, we can have one reference from a family member and we can have one reference from work, but we do ask for a bit of a mix up of those references. Um, we, as I said, we would ask for a medical. The reason we do that is because we just need to, as I said, make sure that everybody is in a fit um, and healthy state to be able to look after a child. That's not saying that you can't have a health condition because obviously we wouldn't rule anybody out for that, but we want to look that that health condition, whatever it is, um, is something that is being managed. If it's something that you might be on medication for or that, whatever. Um, the We ask you to go and uh, visit your doctor. They do a medical report. They send that off to our medical advisor who then basically gives us advice as to your health and well-being. But this is a no cost to you. We cover we cover, we cover the cost of the medicals. Yeah. Um, then we do a DBS, which is um, just basic um, background checks. And that's kind of stage one, but also within stage one and stage two of the assessment, we're looking at things like asking you to do bits of homework. We ask you to do a chronology, which is a massive kind of piece of work, which is looking at your um, history, for instance, when you went to school, when you got married, if you got married and all of those kind of major events in your life, your chronologies um, will cover that. There was quite a lot involved in the assessment. Uh, the assessment can take anything between four to six months. The reason it takes that long is because it's really managing um, when you're available, when the social worker can come, how long it takes for you to maybe do some work in between the visits. It's normally about six to eight visits. There will be a period of um, time when they want to speak if you do have birth children to the children um, by themselves, just to sort of check that they're all happy and on board. Um, it's a very, very thorough piece of work. And the reason that is, is because we need to know that where we're, our children are going to go and stay and be cared for, that that is an environment that is going to be um, healthy for them and that you're also in a kind of robust um, state kind of time of, of your life to enable you to be able to foster because the children that we're placing, um, that you're, you would be care, caring for. They're not always straightforward. Um, they've they are seen with being, they, no. Yeah, they've not had a, they've obviously not had a great start in life. Um, and what we're looking for is people to be able to care for them and to make their lives better. And we also want to make sure that it's going to make your life better too. So we're, we're really kind of um, making sure that that assessment covers everything it needs. I was actually a foster carer before I started this job. So now that is a few years ago because I have been doing the job for a while. Um, so I obviously have done the assessment. I found it something in, you know, I thought it was enjoyable. I thought it was quite therapeutic. It gave me a chance to think about, I suppose, my my kind of past, my, you know, how I grew up, my parents. Um, and it was nice. I quite enjoyed it. But then I do talk quite a lot, so I quite enjoy talking to people. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it isn't something to be worried about or concerned about. But obviously what we want to make sure is you have a good understanding of what you're signing up for, I suppose. Um, once you've completed your assessment and during that time you would have done your preparation training, then um, a report is put together, which is um, quite a hard concept to get your mind around that after months of these conversations, social workers managed to <laughs> put it all together in what's called a Form F. 
you get to read that before it goes to uh, panel. You're invited to go to panel too, and then that's when a, um, a group of people look at your um, form F, they'll meet you, meet your social worker, and they basically then recommend you to be a foster carer. We don't take people to panel unless we're very confident that you're in a position to be recommended because there would be absolutely no point in that. So throughout the assessment, if there's anything that we think we need to cover in more depth, then we would do that before we would go to panel. Uh, the panel is made up of a group of professionals um, who have some experience of fostering. They might be foster carers themselves, um, could be a social worker, there might be a counsellor, there might be somebody um, from medical uh, kind of background. So they're um, a group of people that are in a position to be able to recommend you. And then you go on to being fully approved once the agency decision maker, the RADM, has signed that all off. And once you are approved between yourself and your social worker, you start to have conversations about the children that we would be looking at placing with you. Um, they do profile, don't they? So part of their assessment that they create a profile of you. Yeah, so it's like um, that can be it will be a visual profile, so it can have a picture of yourselves as the foster carers, um, your children. It would have a picture of your house, maybe of the room where the child's yeah. going to stay. Pets, your pets. Okay. Um, because what that's basically trying to do is to be able to for a child to be able to look at that profile and think that they they can see themselves there. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And um, animals are quite an interesting thing because I think that for most children, having a house where there's a pet is something that they can that kind of is a comforting mm. thought, especially if they've never been allowed to have one. Yep. Yeah, I mean, not all of our carers do have animals, but I do think that um, for me, I know that sometimes it was like a, a bit of a barrier to you could use to um, break down by saying, you know, talking about your animals yeah. and things like that. It, um, but funnily enough, there is an assessment done on the animal, yeah. so a dog assessment. Um, so, yeah, so then we would start talking a little bit about the children. So we're getting some kind of we're getting some questions yet. Yeah. Oh, some questions. Yeah, what kind of package uh, we offer? What kind of package? Yeah, what, what was the, what kind of package do we offer as a service? Okay, so um, as I said a bit earlier, let me stop sharing this now. Um, as I said earlier, what we basically let's stop sharing it. Sorry. Um, perhaps I'm sharing it twice. No, you're all right. Um, right, sorry. Um, so yeah, so what we basically offer is um, there is a fostering fee that covers, um, that helps uh, you, I suppose. So th the allowance is given uh, to cover the ch cost of the child. So that's for things like their clothing, um, toys, hobbies just basically keeping the house warm, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the, the allowance is purely for the child. Then on top of that, you get a fostering fee. Um, and that is basically um, paid on your experience and your kind of ability to foster. So you come in at basic level and then you can work your way up to um, earn more money. What you have to remember when we talk about your fees and allowances is you only get those when the child is living with you. So between placements there, um, in, except in one of our schemes, there isn't any finance given to you. So quite often we would be asking and talking about your financial situation to know that um, you're not just relying on fostering for your income. Um, the other kind of part of the package that Oxfordshire County Council offers, as I said, we offer a 1,500 um, setup fee. So that's time to give you transition from um, into foster, becoming a foster carer. We also, you have a supervising social worker who is allocated to you to make sure that you're being 
um you know uh, that Fully supported. Fully supported. But thank you. <laughs> Got a little bit muddled. Um, then um, there are foster carers who we employ and call carer coordinators. They're there to basically help you by being, um, well, because they've been it, been there, uh, done that, been there, uh, done that. <laughs> then they know exactly what they're talking about. So sometimes there might be something that you want to ask a foster carer rather than asking your social worker because they can just quite quickly give you the answer. And they're on the end of a telephone, or you know, you meet them at support groups. We hold support groups monthly. There are support groups all across the county, so it doesn't matter where you live. You should have one. Yeah, there's always you know, having access to one. Some are in the evening and some are in the day. Um, We've had virtual ones as well before now, haven't we? We have had virtual yeah. ones. Obviously, um, during the pandemic, everything went virtual. So, but we know that our carers prefer to meet up face to face, have a cup of coffee, have a chat. Um, also, our carers, as I said earlier, they do. Um, they connect in other ways. So for instance, there's a WhatsApp group, there's a Facebook, closed Facebook group. So things can be posted on there that can't be seen by everybody. So I think the support that's given by other carers is really important alongside the support that you get from the fostering service, alongside your training that you're given um, and alongside um, the support that the OFCA can offer. It's a it's a package that means that everything is local to you. It's on your doorstep. You're not having to travel to uh, to training um, or to your support group. Um, so everything is on hand and very accessible. And I think that that's really important. Okay, so we've had a question pop in. Um, what about working? Can I work and foster? Uh, yes, you can. A lot of our carers are working and fostering. As I said, that's actually um, quite important if you're um, so therefore you're not relying totally on fostering um, as an, as your income. Um, so some of our foster carers, we might have um, a couple. One of them uh, works full time and the other one is working part time and, for, and they kind of work around that. Uh, but you can work um, full time and foster. You can work full time and foster just at the weekends. Um, that's relief fostering or respite care or offering short breaks to children with disabilities. Um, that some local authorities and fostering agencies are prescriptive about the number of hours you can work. We, we're not like that. We're not saying you can work up to 16 hours or whatever. What we would say is whatever your situation is, we can talk to you about, um, you know, how that would look at, alongside fostering. And we would say to you things like what kind of support network do you have? Because if a child is at school, but they're unwell, we need to know that they can be picked up just like if, no, in, in if it was your own child. That's really, right. Yeah. Um, so we would just talk about if you're at work, who would be able to do that? Or would you would you be able to leave work and go and pick um, up the child? Some employers are fostering friendly and they actually give people time off um, to help them foster. So it's always worth checking out if if your employer is one OCC one is one a lot of the like Tesco's some of the banks are there are a number of employers now that are OCC for it um fostering friendly which makes it really I suppose you should point out as well about the use of like, after school clubs and breakfast clubs yeah I mean it would be fair to say that um when I when I worked um, full time and my children were young, my children did go to breakfast club and after school club because that was the only way I could work. But our children, our children that you would be fostering, they're not really able to manage that because of their the disruptions that they've had in their um, lives because of maybe how um, that makes them feel. They need that they need to be. Um, 
at home, home. Yeah. A, little bit, a little bit, bit more stability. a bit more stability a bit more settled um and so really we have to work around what you would do if other than um, yeah. school clubs and things like that um so yeah so really there is no how you know dead set about hours and working um we just look at that as an individual basis and i think that's really important to say that actually that's what we do in all in, in the whole thing we're not asking for certain types of people we're looking for all types of people and we have all types of children yeah so it's um it's really worth having a conversation with us so we can find out more about you and then we go from there everybody's got something different to offer exactly Honestly. yeah and we always say that um age is not a barrier your life experience mm. is what's important so and i think actually you know that that that's what we're looking for people that do have a lot of life experience because that will help them care for our children yeah have we got any more questions no, not in um, I suppose we, now would be perhaps a good time to discuss the different services, the different, types of fostering. different types of fostering. Yeah. So um, initially, when a child first um, comes into into a situation where they need to be fostered, that will probably be on an emergency basis. Um, well, not probably, but it could be on an emergency basis. So we might know um, nothing about that child whatsoever um and they need so they might have um they the children might have turned up at a police station for instance or any or anything like that we've had children that literally have been it's dropped our office yeah they? so in that situation we look for foster carers who are able to take that child a child that we probably know very little about and look after them just for a few days until we can find out what's going on. They might go straight home if that situation is possible, um, or they might go and stay with other foster carers. So that's kind of like that emergency type care. Um, the, the more kind of planned situation is where a child is going to stay with you for a short term basis. So this is about um, when a child is staying with you from anything from a few days right up until about 18 months. So they um, were working with the family to try and hope that the child can go home. Uh, we will also in some situations be working alongside the courts that are making decisions about whether the child can go home. Um, and so what we ask for our foster carers at this point is to be quite flexible because at first we might have said oh you know can you have a child to stay with you for three months but then because of the courts and everything it takes much longer so then we might have to extend that so we ask for people to be very flexible because what we don't want is to have a child stay with you for a while and then have to go to stay because that's that's not right um so at some point the decision will be made for the child to know whether they are going to go home whether they're going to stay with foster carers on a long-term basis or whether in, if they're of a age usually under seven or eight they would be adopted so then we talk to you as a foster carer and say okay so now we can tell you exactly what the situation is some of our short-term carers even stay we would like to have the child stay with us long term. Um, so you you can be approved to have a child long term, which means basically for a child to stay with you until they reach adulthood, until they're being able to live um, independently. independently and go off and do their own thing. But obviously, even then, foster carers quite often support those young people right for, forever sometimes. Yeah. Um, so that is emergency short term long term relief is when you look after a child um, just at the weekends so sometimes we look for our children to come and stay with the carer for a weekend when they're still living at home but what the the family's going through a period of crisis and they need that help one weekend a month or even sometimes every weekend for a brief period of time just until they can get things settled Sometimes relief care is put in place when the child's living with a foster carer mm -hmm. and that foster carer needs just um, a little bit of help. 
Um, sometimes relief care isn't so much one weekend a month, but maybe during school holidays. So that could be if a foster carer is going to go on holiday for a week. Um, in not all situations have we got the child's passport. So sometimes that means a child can't go on holiday with their foster family. So they're going to stay with another foster family. So that's a bit about relief. Um, short breaks is quite different because that's it is one weekend a month looking after a child who has a disability. The reason it's very different from our um, kind of mainstream fostering is because you're working much closer with the family. It's very important for a family that their child is going to somewhere where they feel really safe and secure about that because it's a it's a huge upheaval for them. They need they want to have that kind of break. They want to have that time where they can, I don't know, go go Christmas shopping or something without having the kind of child with them. So they want to have a break. They want to have a bit of a rest, but for them to let go of their child, they need that real security of knowing that the carers um, know the child well and they know them well. So when you look after a child under the short break scheme, the introductions are very um, it's a long introduction period for at first you just meet the child maybe for a couple of hours and then slowly over a period of a few months you'll have yeah, an overnight exactly. stay and it's um i think it's it's a really nice thing because as the carer you have a really close relationship with the family and you really get to know each other mm -hmm. and they have to share a lot of knowledge with you about how their child is progressing and in that situation you might have to have some special training medical training I don't know, tube feeding, that kind of yeah. thing. Um, so that's uh, short breaks. We've got mother and baby or parent and child fostering, which is where a um, young parent, a new parent, isn't able to live independently with their new baby. So they come and stay with the foster carer for a period of up to about 12 weeks. Um, during that time, there's an assessment which is being done, which is basically to make a decision whether they are able really to go off on their own and care for the baby. So there might be some risks involved. It might be that the, um, the young parent um, has had to have need, um, kind of care themselves in the past. There could be lots of reasons why we're not quite sure about the situation. So we do that assessment and then we make the decision um, about what will happen after the 12 week period. Some of our foster carers are very um, worried. I'm sure you've had them ask even at that initial call about how they will feel when a child moves on, because obviously they don't have the child necessarily living with them forever. And I think in situations with like the parent and child, it's really important to think that you're enabling somebody to move on to their next situation. If you have a child short term and then they go to move on to live with their adoptive parents, it's based on the relationship that they had with you that enables them to become kind of robust enough and secure enough in their emotional kind of being to move on to something more permanent. Especially if they come in quite shy, they're quiet, or they've had quite a bit of trauma. Yeah, they're usually it's really with a while when that to yeah. build up any sort of Yeah, no, confidence. totally. I mean it's that that initial care that they get that helps them for the rest of their life, really. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that carers see that yes, some you know, the child is leaving, but they don't leave your memory, your what you've done stays with them. And I think that that's why a lot of our foster carers actually do what they do. But I think that's what some foster carers and the thought of it is a bit of a struggle. Yeah. And I think if any foster carer would admit that that first time is really hard, um, but it does get a little bit easier. Um, and some of our foster carers do have a bit of a break sometimes in between. Um, having a child stay with them before another one comes to stay because of how they feel. Some, you know, some don't need that. But um, so I think that's probably all of our types of fostering. Yeah. Um, we do have something called the Mockingbird Hub, which is um, a 
it's kind of a little bit complicated, but basically it's a way of uh, foster carers supporting each other. So you have what is called a cluster of foster carers and you have a hub carer and they'll be in a locality that's very um, close to them because it wouldn't work if not. So the the hub carer supports the cluster of foster carers and supports those children and they meet up regularly on a monthly basis to do an activity or an event. So they might go, go bowling. They meet up more often, um, the carers between themselves. The children see it as another um, home they can go to. So it might be it might be that they help after school and things. So it's kind of like building a wider family network, I suppose. Somebody different you can perhaps rely on or talk to if, if you feel like your foster carer isn't necessarily comforting in that respect, but then you've got somebody else yeah, you can no, talk it, to or yeah, confide or it, in. Yeah, it might be that, um, I don't know, you've got a keen interest in football yeah. um, and your carer, you know, it, doesn't want isn't doing that but goes and does and you yeah. go off and do it with somebody else or something like that so it does work well or if there's like me my son will bore me senseless with football but yet he will talk to his dad quite happily about, about football, football. So got... yeah <laughs> yeah so um that's kind of a, a bit about the mockingbird um I think about something that I should have thought if we've got any other questions mm -hmm. coming through mm -hmm. um I don't know Anybody have any questions? Yeah, so anyway, I think basically, um, I mean, we we are probably trying to cover <laughs> cover everything quite um, quickly. But there are always going to be lots of more questions that people might want to ask. And if that's the case, then you always can. You don't have to. You can just email in, ask us a question. You can go online um, and ask um, any questions that you have. OK, interesting question coming. All right. I've not had this one before. Do you provide opportunities to sponsor a foster child through a career opportunity? Do we provide opportunities to sponsor a foster child to a new career opportunity? Um, there's always support somewhere, isn't there? Yeah, I mean, there will be. I, I, I would think. I know, for instance, we have done things in the past to do with um, we had a child that wanted to be sponsored to do with them um, music at college. I mean, I think we do. I think, to be honest, I don't know enough about that specific question. So we could, um, if you want to email it into us, email so we, can it in, that, we, we could that we could find that out. But they're probably I mean, that would be more come under the the social worker, the child social worker and that kind of team and we have something called the children in care council and they do an awful lot of work um kind of promoting and helping out um the children that we look after um so yeah i'm sorry that i haven't been able to be a bit clearer on that but yeah feel honestly feel free if you want to email that in to us we can follow we, it up a bit more yeah we can get that sent across the social workers to see if they've got anything on that. Not had one like that before. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I think we've okay. pretty much yeah, well, I think that, anyway. yeah, I think we have really probably covered everything as much as we can. But like I said, we are absolutely open to anybody getting in touch with us at any point you don't have to be at the point where you think i definitely want to foster with you right now a lot of people take a long time it's a big decision and there's a lot of things to find out about and we do have people that come to us and then it, they decide it's not the right time but they might come to that in six months yeah. and that's absolutely fine so yeah please do get in touch if there's anything you want to ask us or talk about um, and hopefully um, we will see you soon. Yeah, I look forward to hopefully hearing some new inquiries. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you very much and good night. Bye.